walk. Um, they couldn't stand on their feet. You know, they couldn't use their hands. Um, hypertension that where the, the, the diastolic or the bottom number is, is over 100. Um, being covered in a rash from head to toe, head to toe, and having it being very uh, painful and um, itching. Uh, hypothyroidism can be, you know, severe. Uh, sometimes there can be some bleeding or changes in platelets. Okay. Um, uh, with these, um, with all of these drugs. Um, is there a typical um, amount of time that someone's usually on a treatment? Um, as we know that there's none of them is, is yet to be seen as the cure. Um, so would patients expect to be on drugs for, for a lifetime? Uh, the answer to that is uh, probably for the most part, for the most part, yes. It doesn't mean that there may, that there may not be breaks in therapy from time to time. But these, are, as long as it's helping and patients are tolerating, we're going to keep them on. Sometimes we can modify the schedule. Sometimes we can give longer breaks. Uh, but haven't really uh, discontinued anybody's therapy just because they're doing well. Okay. But we have made modifications in there. Uh, um, like their schedule. Okay. Um, a couple more questions regarding um, some side effects specifically. Um, anything, um, have you seen a lot of patients with nose bleeding and, and ways to kind of um, help with that? Um, I've seen a lot of patients have mild nose bleeds where it's never been very difficult to stop the bleeding. Um, I've also seen patients who they'll just maybe describe when they blew their nose, their nose or when they sneeze, there's a little bit of blood-tinged um, mucus. But again, nothing that's been that difficult to control. However, there's been exceptions. And I've had had patients that have had to go to emergency rooms and had their nose you know, packed uh, because of um, a bad bloody nose. Okay. But there's nothing other than really kind of monitoring the dose and monitoring. Um, sometimes they're on blood thinners, and that can be affected by these medications. So sometimes uh, Coumadin has to be, the dose has to be modified when you're on these drugs. Um, what about um, any suggestions or tips um, with the, the effect of your taste being on these drugs? Um, I have not really found anything that works really well, um, except the fact that knowing that it does get better over time. But the taste buds just are severely affected during the course of this treatment. And when they stop the treatment, it improves, but um, not too much you can do about that. Um. I had a few questions regarding uh, triglycerides um, levels while being on these drugs. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to um, help with that side effect? Well, if the triglycerides go up, then what we do is we generally um, we can start some medications that can lower uh, both cholesterol and triglycerides. And we usually will send patients, sometimes a cardiologist, endocrinologist, to help with that. But the statins can be helpful in reducing those blood levels. Okay. Um, what about um, helping with weight gain, especially, um, you know, sometimes with a nausea or not having appetite? Is there anything that they can take to help um, gain weight? Oh, to gain weight? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think that frequent meals throughout the day, um, over-the-counter products like Ensure are very helpful. Um, and if those can be taken a couple times during the day, um, that, that really seems to work. And there are some agents, some medications called you know, Megase that maybe your doctor would want to prescribe that really does a nice job of increasing um, one's appetite. Okay. 
Um, sort of a follow-up question when, when you were talking about uh, thyroid earlier. Um, is the hypothyroidism something that's permanent, or um, if you stopped with these drugs, would it recover? When you stop the medications, it will recover, but it may require being on thyroid replacement for some months afterwards. Just w when you stop the medication, it's not like it reverses itself right away. Okay. Um, when talking about um, the the Met, um, is and you say you know the small Met, um, is there kind of a, a size that you categorize those you know, less than one centimeter, you know, between one and three? Generally, less than one centimeter. Okay. Yeah. Um, without, I guess, getting into too much detail. Um, maybe talk a little bit, um, again, with clinical trials, kind of with the different phases, um, you know, what a patient can expect in, in various phases of a clinical trial. And the different phases? Sure. Yes. A phase one trial is a clinical trial in which there's a new molecule that has never been used before in humans. They've done a lot of preclinical work on this molecule and it's now ready to be tested in human subjects. And many times they have, they don't know exactly what dose is the right dose to give, so they start very low and then they work their way up. And they very uh, monitor for side effects. And every time you get maybe three or four patients through a certain dose and they've gone through the cycle safely, then you can bump up to the next dose. A phase two trial is really kind of an outpour from the phase one, because a phase one study can be any type of tumor type. So let's say they, they found some activity in lung cancer or colorectal cancer. They now will take those various tumor types and test that drug in the dose that was defined in the phase one in what we call a phase two. So then we'd really get a much better um, picture of how effective this drug really is in a various tumor. And then from a phase two, if it looks like this drug is going to um, be promising, it's taken to a phase three trial during which the investigational treatment is compared to standard of care. And then we see how it compares to that. So we have phase one, new molecule, phase two, really looking at efficacy, and phase three, comparing it to standard of care. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we're just about um, at the end. Um, just a few more things I wanted to mention, um, just from some of the questions that we've had. Um, if you are interested in learning more about clinical trials, we do have a section on the Kidney Cancer Association website. Um, if you you can either search or just click on the the subheading for clinical trials, um, and we've got we have a, a link to the uh, NCI clinical trial database as well as a matching service with um, Emerging Med that they both have 800 numbers that you can call and speak to someone um, if you'd like to learn more or see a trial that might be right for you. Um, also was asked again to repeat um, the chat room to speak with other patients and survivors, and that is you can get to it from the Kidney Cancer Association website, that's kidneycancer.org, um, or you can go to kcalist.com. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this will be available on our website probably sometime next week so that you can go back um, and listen to, to the, whole, the whole presentation again or any section that you, that you might uh, want a little more information on. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, Nancy, thank you again for your time tonight. I think this was very, very, very helpful thank and educational. You. And um, please be sure to check the Kidney Cancer Association website um, for more upcoming programs. We do have another webinar scheduled um, in November, so there will be more details available um, within the coming weeks on that. So thank you again, everyone, and have a good evening.